We're pleased to be partnered with the Broadcasting Board of Governors as we continue our monthly series on topical research findings from various markets around the world. This effort is in support of BBG's mission to inform, engage, and connect people around the world in support of freedom and democracy. Today, we're going to take a look at women's media consumption habits across Africa and how those choices impact their lives. For those of you who have attended these events previously, we've largely focused on a specific country. And we thought it was a, it would be interesting to take more of a deep dive and look at gender-related um, media usage issues. So we're going to spend uh, today's event, and I think we're also going to do some follow-up um, sessions on other regions in the world. We're focused on Africa, on women's use of, of media in Africa, and in future sessions we'll look at other regions around the world. Our next event will be October 16th, and that will focus on, on Pakistan. It's my pleasure this morning to introduce Ms. Tara Sonenshine, a former member of the Broadcasting Board of Governors. She's a distinguished fellow of the George Washington School of Media and Public Affairs and the former Under Secretary of State for Public Diplomacy and Public Affairs. She previously served as the Executive Vice President of the United States Institute of Peace, and prior to joining USIP, she was a st strategic communications advisor to many international organizations, including USIP, the International Crisis Group, Internews, CARE, the American Academy of Diplomacy, and the International Women's Media Foundation. She served in various capacities at the White House during the Clinton administration, including Transition Director, Director of Foreign Policy Planning for the National Security Council, and Special Assistant to the President and Deputy Director of Communications. Prior to the Clinton administration, Ms. Sonnenschein was a editorial producer of ABC News' Nightline, where she worked for more than a decade. She was also an off-air reporter at the Pentagon for ABC World News Tonight and is the recipient of 10 News Emmy Awards for coverage of international affairs. Please join me in, in welcoming Ms. Tara Sonnenschein. Well, thank you and good morning. How, how is everybody? Sounds awfully quiet in here. Um, well, I want to begin by thanking Chris and my colleagues at BBG, Bruce Sherman and others, um, for setting up what I think is a very important conversation and to be putting Africa, media, and women in one soup bowl is quite, um, intriguing, and for me, three subjects I care deeply about. How many of you care about Africa? How many of you care about women? And of course, a few people in here, I think, care about media. So what happens when we put them all together? I want to look um, at the convergence and the intersection of some of these, um, but I think you first have to disaggregate a little bit uh, the pieces of this three-legged stool. Africa, not exactly something you can generalize about a place like Africa. If I asked you how many countries are part of Africa, some of you bright, smart people, how many countries are we talking about? Depends exactly how you count, but um, certainly over 50 distinct and different countries, and distinct and different within each country, not just across. Rural Africa is very different in many ways from urban Africa. So it is tough to generalize, and I do so very carefully, and I think as um, public diplomats, as media, as polling experts, we want to be careful when we choose our words and frame our questions. Um, firstly, a few things do get generalized and jump out at us, which is that Africa is a young and growing younger <clears throat> country. And it has a population of young people, about 200 million. <clears throat> 200 million is a big number. And it is fully half of the population that is under 18, according to UN estimates. Now, that is a huge market, a huge consumer market, but it's also a huge 
market of people that will need to be employed, educated, have health services delivered, be engaged, and have access. And I think we sometimes leapfrog over the needs and the basic primary school needs, particularly for African girls, and we need to underscore those needs before we just make assumptions about consumption and patterns. There are some 30 million primary school age children that are not in school in Africa. That's about one in four in the region. African schools are doing more and more to enroll students, but it is important to remind everyone that there are huge gaps in electricity, in services, in teachers, in textbooks, and thus that leads us to ask about media. The one thing I would say is that it is vital that we measure and measure carefully the media sector. We know that in Africa, many people have done the leapfrog over television and even at times over radio to own a cell phone. And that cell phone needs to be thought of within the context of education. It is an informal, educative way to reach people and move people and change lives, and we need to pay attention to PDAs as we look at Africa and particularly African women and girls. Now, there are also some social and cultural factors that as we talk about Africa and media, um, and particularly women, we need to keep in mind. There are still some problems that are specific to girls in Africa. One of those is child marriage. Countries like Niger, Chad, Chad, Mali, still have some of the world's highest levels of child marriage. And girls sometimes become brides before they finish primary school. And so as you look at them as an audience, bear in mind that there are specific issues for girls in Africa and specific places where media can address some of those issues carefully, with a clear sense of cultural boundaries, and with an understanding that words matter. Girls are often uncomfortable in formal education settings in Africa simply because it is perhaps their time of the month, or perhaps they don't feel comfortable in the bathrooms or latrines in African schools. So again, as you look at women and media and the role of media in educating, uplifting, addressing inequities, closing gaps, inclusion, diversity, tolerance, all the values we hold dear, let's understand some of the motivating factors for why girls don't participate in education, be it informal in the media sector or formal. What we know and what we all accept from the research is that the political, economic, educational, social participation of women in Africa can unlock and unleash enormous dividends. We know that if girls are educated and utilize media and have access to information, they will participate in the political arena, they will exercise their power and leverage in the economic sector, and they will make a huge difference in the global economy. Cell phones, as I mentioned, internet, tablets, online learning, distance learning, all enormous potential for Africa today. One out of two people own that cell phone. And although challenges remain with bandwidth, with access, and with how people use their phones simply to connect with each other or to garner information or to find news, or to seek out education opportunities is something we have to look at. This administration, the Obama administration, is doing a great deal through the Global Women's Initiative, exchange programs, women's radio programs, entrepreneurship, teaching English, connecting women, and more needs to be done. What we need are more statistics and measurements of how is all of that working in the short term, the midterm, and the long term. We need to know if what we are actually supplying is being utilized, read, consumed, and put into action. On the media front, 
please never lose sight of the barriers for journalists and women journalists. Instances of government censorship, harassment of journalists, difficulties for women to report, difficult for them to rise within media management. So we need more media training, we need more openings, internships, exchanges. I'm particularly proud of what BBG is doing in the area of reaching women and particularly its high priority to Africa. BBG outlets are doing great things on shortwave, FM, television, and most importantly, the use of some 11 local languages to reach people. This is the time for BBG, Africa, Gallup, and others to be in the information revolution and focusing on the women of Africa. I know that all of us, particularly BBG, will seek to expand reach, to find new distribution channels and platforms, to add new languages, and to provide more programming that specifically target women, as you do in Tanzania with the Swahili service, with media trainings in Bangladesh, and with radio networks and radio work throughout the continent. Remember that messages can be simple but powerful, complex but meaningful. They can deal with public health and safety. And today as we watch the Ebola virus as it cascades through the continent, remember that those messages will either help people to get to the help they need or to hunker down in their homes. In Liberia where Ebola threatens thousands of citizens, we need public health messaging. In Sierra Leone, women are far behind. Just one statistic, less than 10% of adult women in Sierra Leone have reached secondary or higher levels of education. Uganda needs us. In public schools, one out of four teachers simply don't show up. So where will young people, women and girls, go for their learning? They'll come to the media sector. So let's measure health segments, radio programs, social change, employment, the teaching of English, the creating of opportunities, and let's look at whether we are indeed empowering through media the women and girls of Africa, prioritizing gender equality, building strong, peaceful, and prosperous, prosperous societies. By paying attention, you are doing the first step of showing up at the door of the problem. I know that all of you will continue to invest, to look for the opportunities, and to make sure that we preach and do what we say about diversity, inclusion, tolerance, conflict resolution, and uplifting social, civilized societies. I want to, in advance, apologize for not being able to stay as long, but there's some news interviews today about a subject called Syria, and um, I do have to attend to some of those. But if I can take any questions um, before I turn over to panelists, um, if there are one or two thoughts, um, see who's awake. Anybody? Well, I will leave you with this thought then. As you listen to the other experts today and you go about your daily lives, tweet, tweet about Africa. Every day I try on my own Twitter to find something and often something positive to say. Um, let's not leave Africa painted in dismal terms. Let's not leave it unmeasured, unscrutinized, and unaided in its cause and in its development. Thank you all for the work you do and I'm delighted that I could be with you this morning. Thank you. Thank you, Tara. Our first uh, presenter this morning is um, Magalie Rolt. She's a regional research director here at Gallup and handles Francophone and Lusophone Africa. Magalie's going to share with you some, some um, findings from our Gallup World Poll on well-being and the quality of life for, for women on the continent, as well as some some information about uh, media habits. Please join me in welcoming Magalie Rolt.
Thank you, Chris. Good morning. So my mission this morning uh, is to show you findings from our Whirlpool surveys. And the findings will focus on um, some core issues related to women in Africa. And this is also to set the stage for Sonia's presentation uh, in a little bit. So how do we do Gallup World Poll surveys? So very briefly, um, what we do is we conduct nationally representative samples of the population in each country, population aged 15 and older. And in each country, we survey at least 1,000 individuals every year. Now, for the purposes of this presentation, I'm going to focus on the seven countries that are mentioned on this slide. And the reason why we chose those seven countries is because we did media surveys in 2013, 2014 uh, in those countries, and so we do have basically the Whirlpool findings for the countries as well as uh, media information. So it's a good overlap of the two. Now, I also want to stress, just like Terry um, told us, this is by no stretch representative of the continent, a continent as diverse and as big as, um, as Africa. Um, one little asterisk, since I just told you that we do nationally representative surveys, uh, this is true in most cases, with the exception of Mali. Uh, we were not able to do the survey in four northern provinces. So the provinces of the regions of Timbuktu, Kidal, Gao, and Mopti for very obvious security reasons. And this year again, in just a few weeks, we're going to be doing uh, the 2014 survey in Mali and those four regions will also be excluded. For the purposes of the Whirlpool, though, we do uh, field across the continent, obviously, not just in those seven countries. And then in terms of the sampling, this we do uh, random probability sampling of the interviewing locations, what we call primary sampling units, as well as the households and within the household who's going to be selected for the interview, so the, the actual adult respondent. <clears throat> and those surveys are done in the respondent's home, so they're in Africa, they're done face to face. Here I want to give you basically the core findings, and I selected a very specific topics to focus on every time I travel to the continent, for to train the teams to observe uh, interviews, to basically interact with people. I do talk to women and I wanna know what is important to them. So the topics you're gonna see here reflect what I have heard personally in the field. And the very first thing is the topic of safety. So here we see, and again, this is gonna be based just on data on those seven countries that <clears throat> Afri African women uh, tend to feel less safe in their communities than men. Another very important topic for women in general, but uh, more specifically women in, on the African continent, is health. And we see in our Whirlpool findings that older women, those who are age 35 and above, uh, tend to report more health issues than men their age. Education. Terry told us a lot about education, and that's certainly uh, a very important issue. And here in our data, we do see that the, what I call the parent effect and the importance of parents being educated and what kind of outcome it has on their own children's educational achievement. In terms of life evaluation, how women uh, rate their lives today and lives in the future, what's interesting to see is that they basically rate their lives the same way men do, and we'll get into a little more detail about that. And then finally, attitudes toward media freedom. <clears throat> and here again, we see that 
women and men appear to be um, having the same attitudes toward media freedom again based on those seven countries, but we'll also see that there's a lot of variation across countries. <clears throat> With respect to safety, we want to first look at whether people have confidence in their local police force. And here we see the, the 59, 62%. This is actually not a statistically meaningful difference. So in terms of confidence in the local police force, we see that women are as likely as men to say that they have confidence in the police in their local communities. However, when you look at a little more um, detail, and it's, a, it's a, the question about feeling safe, walking alone at night. And we see that in, across those seven countries, women tend to feel a lot less safe than men do. And this is particularly pronounced in countries like Kenya and also Zimbabwe. It's very striking in Zimbabwe. On the topic of health, there are lots to explore. And first, we wanted to look again at satisfaction with the avail availability of quality health care in their local communities. And here we see that there is no difference between women and men. Uh, now, when you ask people about if they have any health problems that prevent them from doing things that people their age would normally do. You see a very slight difference where women are slightly more likely than men. This, the, the four point difference uh, on the right is actually statistically significant. And again, this is based on those seven countries only. <clears throat> Looking at the health is, uh, of course, highly related to age, and looking at this question about reporting health problems uh, among people who are between the ages of 15 and 34, we see that, well, it's, you know, yes, there are some gender differences, but Ghana, it's essentially flat. Mali, it's also essentially the same, Niger, 24, 26%. It's also relatively similar. There are a few differences. But when you look at the older age cohort, those who are 35 and, and above, then we see that older women are more likely to report having health problems than men do. And this is particularly pronounced in Mali, where more than half of women in that age group report having health problems compared to 31% of men. Education. There's, um, in 2013, <clears throat> we fielded, <clears throat> excuse me, um, an education module because we wanted to get at the quality of education. A lot of times, questions focus on the achievements, educational achievement, without looking as much as the quality piece of education. We have this question, did your parents complete at least primary school? So here we show you the proportion of people who said yes. Yes to what? Both parents completed primary school, at least primary school. My mother only, no, my father only, and neither. So we see that here, based on those seven countries, and I've looked at the data for the 29 countries that we have in 2013, and the numbers are actually very similar. So we have basically less than a third of people who say that both their parents have at least a primary school of education. And then in the next couple of slides, you'll see, you'll better understand why I, I really wanted to focus on, on this particular question. I was interested in looking at when parents are educated or not, whether that has any kind of effect on the next generation, their children. 
And here it appears that when both parents have completed at least primary school, you would be far more likely to have yourself at least completed secondary education compared to you know, people, if it's only your mother, the mother, or only the father, or if neither parent. It's very striking because it's, it's the, the, the proportion of people who were able to, to have a secondary level of education if both their parents have a lower level of education is very striking at 75%. However, when you look at these data across countries, <clears throat> excuse me, you can see um, that there are major differences. In Zimbabwe, this is very powerful to have two parents who have at least a primary level of education for the next generation to basically achieve even higher. This is not as true in Mali. And obviously, those two countries are very different, and their educational systems are also very different. So this is just a little flavor for you to, um, to think about, and there's much more to explore here. But the parent effect, in general, is very striking across most countries in Africa. In terms of how women evaluate their lives, <clears throat> we have this question uh, where we, it's actually the very first question on our Whirlpool questionnaire. Um, and we ask people to imagine a ladder. And the ladder is, goes from zero to 10. And zero is the worst possible life for you. And 10 is the best possible life for you. Where do you think you stand today? And here we see that actually it's, it's, remarka it's remarkable, at least to me, uh, how similar men and women rate their lives. And this is, a, this is a question that is actually highly correlated to income, to health. Um, so when people think about where they stand on this ladder, they are thinking about all these things that are happening in, in their lives. However, even though we have uh, virtually or very little gender differences within countries, we do have differences across countries. And the differences, at least the ones that I see, are, for me, two major groups on this slide. The first group is the, the, in the first group you have Kenya, Mali, Niger, and Côte d'Ivoire. And they are the, the countries where people, where women uh, rate their lives at a four or below. And then the second group, Ghana, Nigeria, Zimbabwe, that is where women and men rate uh, their current lives over four. So it's, it's really, Two, the, the main differences are more across countries than they are within countries. And then in terms of where people think that they're gonna be standing five years from now, this is for us a measure of hope. And so you have the today, and it's usually, usually a lot lower than the future. And so we do see that there is hope for a better future across the board, but here again, we see differences mainly across countries where you have um, a cluster of countries where people rate their future lives above seven, Nigeria, Zimbabwe, um, and Ghana, and to some extent, Côte d'Ivoire. And then another cluster where it is less than seven, Kenya, which is surprising to me because it's, especially when it's sitting right next to Mali and Niger, and Kenya is more developed, relatively speaking, than Mali and Niger. So it is surprising to see that Kenya would be in um, the second group. And finally, and that this is also to transition uh, into Sonia's presentation, looking at how people perceive freedom of the press in their countries. 
So as I mentioned in the summary slide, it's essentially um, having no gender differences based on those seven countries where women and men are as likely to report um, that the, the press in their country has a lot of freedom. But here again, the main differences are more across countries than within countries. So you have here what I see is more three countries. Two at the bottom, Nigeria and Zimbabwe, where um, attitudes toward a free press are relatively low. Then you have Côte d'Ivoire, which tends to be in the middle. About half of the people think that uh, there is a lot of freedom of the press in Côte d'Ivoire. And then the last group of countries where, uh, in, with Ghana, Kenya, Mali, and Niger, where uh, a strong majority of both women and men say that the media in their countries have a lot of freedom. I'm going to stop right here. <clears throat> and we'll take your questions later. Thank you, Magli. Our next presenter this morning is uh, Ms. Sonia Glocal from the Broadcasting Board of Governors. She's the Director of Research for the International Broadcasting Bureau. Sonia's got a unique perspective. While she oversees the, the overall research program for, for BBG, she also, uh, for the last seven, eight years, has focused on, on Africa. So. She's got some deep insights on, on the continent, and we're, we're fortunate to have her this morning sharing um, some views on media usage of, of women on the continent. So please join me in welcoming Sonia. Thank you, Chris. And so we've heard from Magali this morning that we've heard about women's current situation, where they are in lives, what their outlook is, and the issues that they care about, such as safety and health. And Magali has also picked up on what I think will be a red thread f through today's event. Um, Tara had raised it um, very prominently this morning already, education. You mentioned education, and education will really be what will guide us through media use in Africa. Um, Quick word on the survey methodology. These BBG Gallup media surveys um, were done in exactly the same countries as the countries we selected for the World Poll data today. They are all fairly recent, um, done in 2013 and 2014. And as you can see, in most countries, we managed to cover pretty much the entire population, thanks to Gallup. And um, in Mali, however, we had the same problems as the World Poll. We were unable to go to northern Mali. So whenever I say Mali, you can picture southern Mali. And um, in terms of sample sizes, um, the sample size for the BBG media surveys is a little bit higher than um, for the World Poll, ranging from about 1,500 to 4,000 uh, 4, in Nigeria. And the reason why we pick such large sample sizes is that we do a lot of very robust sub-sample analysis. For the first few slides, I would like to take you through women's daily use of several platforms because I think the differences are really striking, not just between men and women, but also between countries and also, most importantly, between platforms. Uh, starting off with television, what I actually think is the most interesting factor here that in fact, there are virtually no differences in daily media use between men and women. And um, having worked on Africa issues for a while and having visited many, many households um, observing interviews, we have a suspicion on why this might be. Um, in Africa, if a household has a television, it tends to be a single television household still. Televisions are usually a prized possession and are located in a common room, and hence a lot of television viewing is actually a communal activity, something you share with your family. So indeed, the fact that the exposure rates of men and women on daily television use are similar is not a surprise to us. But now look at radio, and you can really see very big differences between men, male and female, yes, daily use of radio. And also, if I can just quickly, um, I know it's, it's difficult to have those on the slides, but just focus on Cote d'Ivoire on the very left, and let me drop back quickly to the previous slide, television use. 52% of women in Cote d'Ivoire use television on a daily basis, compared to 28% 
of women who use radio on a daily basis. Again, I find this finding really fascinating because for so many years we had always assumed, of, we had always presumed the um, radio dominance in Africa and we're really seeing through our annual surveys, we're really seeing some big shifts here. Um, you can also see big differences between men and women in how they use radio. For example, let's pick a very prominent one, Niger. Just 18% of women use radio on a daily basis compared to 37% of men. Now, I had just mentioned that television viewing is really a communal activity. However, um, one of the theories why men are more likely to use radio on a daily basis has also to do with the cell phone ex explosion in Africa. Um, by owning a mobile phone, and men are still li more likely to personally own a mobile phone than women, many, many of those mobile phone models have built-in FM receivers, and we, in our surveys we measure when we ask people how do you listen to the radio, we've seen a real big uptick in people using their mobile phones, not to stream radio, but to simply use the FM receiver and listen to the radio while they're out and about. And hence, radio um, listening is becoming a personal activity. You do it while you're out and about, you're listening on via headphones, in transit, etc. So this could account for one of the differences in radio use. Daily internet use, um, you can see, is still lagging far, far behind. Um, radio and television. However, we, that's also the area where we're really seeing the strongest growth in year-to-year -year, um, trend analysis. Some countries are still, um, internet use is still very minimal and there you don't even see any differences between men and women such as Mali and Niger. But then in countries where internet has already ticked up quite a bit, um, in Nigeria and Zimbabwe, for example, in Nigeria, the rate of men, 24%, twice that as women, um, just 12% of whom go on the internet on a daily basis. Social networking, um, this is on a, we, ask this about, we ask about social networking on a weekly basis, and we also have learned the hard way that we do not ask um, social networking based on internet, because a lot of people use, um, you know, if you use an, your Facebook app on a mobile phone, a lot of respondents wouldn't even realize that they're actually using the internet while they're using this app. So we, we don't filter this at all, we ask, everyone if they use social networking. And you can see the patterns are fairly similar, um, except for this is on a weekly basis, now not on a daily basis. Um, I have just already mentioned mobile phones, and you can also see here there are still some very big differences. But I, what I find the most interesting about the data that we've collected here, you can see that in Mali Niger, where cell phone ownership is still low, comparatively low, you, that's where you have the really big gender gaps. And once you have reached sort of a critical mass of over 50% or two-thirds in a country, the gender gap in um, mobile phone ownership goes down. Now, we don't have any hard data for this, but having looked at other sources as well, one reason why this might be is that men tend to be the early adopters. So if there's the first mobile phone in the household is usually owned by the father, the brother, and then as they upgrade to the next model, and it's always aspirational to get a better mobile phone, that next, the second de device that was previously used tends to be handed down to the mother, the sister, the wife. And so as mobile phone penetration in a market gets higher and higher, the gender gap in personal mobile phone ownership tends to go down. The next couple of slides are devoted to um, what languages people speak, and I'm, I want to focus your attention on those for two reasons. First of all, um, the knowledge of French and English in the markets that we're looking at here today is also a very good proxy for education. In order to um, speak French or to speak English, you will have typically attended school. And the other reason why we're using it is in many of those markets, you need to speak these languages if you want to have the full selection of platforms and media outlets available in a country. Um, and so hence, knowing a language like French or English will help you having the selection of media outlets. Um, very big differences between market, it, markets. In Cote d'Ivoire, over four in five women speak French hence allowing them to fully participate in the media environment. In Mali, very, very few women um, speak French and 
Um, Voice of America has, for example, already reacted to that fact by introducing vernacular broadcasting there in order to um, open up the media sector to women. In Ghana, 43% um, of women speak English, the language that a lot of the media outlets are in, um, slightly lower than men at 56%. And in Nigeria, the language uh, situation is a little bit more complicated here um, because Hausa is also obviously a very important um, media language. And so if 78% of women speak either English or Hausa, um, Slightly, high, uh, slightly lower than male, um, 88%. And for the last couple of slides, I wanted to draw your attention to two case studies. We're looking at Mali and Nigeria, and there we are actually adding several factors together just to illustrate how education and language skills can have an effect on women's media use. You can see in Mali, for example, women who speak French, and we have just seen only 15% speak French, so we're really talking about an elite here, a well-educated elite, and you can see what happens right away. Their use of media is significantly higher than the media use of women overall. 63% um, of women who speak French in Mali use television daily, 14% use the internet daily, 82% use a mobile phone. Those are women who can very easily be reached by um, various media platforms. But then when you look at women with low levels of education, um, daily internet use is actually straight at zero. Um, only a quarter of them own mobile phones. So those are much more difficult, it's much more difficult to get in touch with those through um, new media platforms and radio in fact does remain the best platform to talk to women with low education in Mali. In Nigeria, you can see that um, women with low education, again, radio is really still the key um, means to get in touch with them. Internet is absolutely not the right way to go, um, and mobile phone, too, is uh, much lower than general mobile phone ownership. I also, now that we've looked how women consume media, we also should not neglect to see how women then pass on what they learned in the media and share news with their friends and families. Um, for the most part, I think the encouraging news is that in um, the left-hand side of the slide, Cote d'Ivoire, Ghana, and Kenya, women's media sharing is actually just as frequent as that of men. And even in countries like Mali, Niger, and Zimbabwe, women share news at fairly similar rates as men. So. Once you have been able to share your information with women, it gets multiplied at almost the same rates as amongst men. Um, just summing up, education and language skills are really the main factors that influence um, which, access, which platforms women access most frequently. Other factors that we've looked at but that didn't play such big roles were, uh, and they're all linked really, um, income, um, urbanicity, and one more that I'm blanking on right now. Um, daily media use is very similar for men and women, but women tend to lag behind men in terms of radio and internet use. And also, once a country reach, reaches a critical mass in mobile penetration, the gaps between male and female mobile own, phone ownership decrease very rapidly, and the largest gaps that we find are in countries where the mobile market is still developing. And now we're ready for questions, I think. We're going to have a, a moderated roundtable here with our, our speakers, but joining that that uh, the, the panel on the stage is uh, Mr. Bruce Sherman, the um, Director of Office of Strategy and Development at BBG. We'll spend uh, about 10, 10 minutes or so with a uh, moderated session here, and then we'll go into to Q and A. Bruce, over to you. Uh, thanks, everybody. Thank you, Magali and, and uh, Sonia, for the presentation. They're very, very good. Um, I, I'd like to start with uh, one question that goes back to the seven countries that were selected. Uh, you explained, Magali, why we did that. We had surveys looking at media use and looking at from the World Poll, looking at attitudes 
uh, in, these, in these seven places. Um, but both Magdalene and Sonia, um, although they're not meant to be representative of the entire continent, we've already talked about that. How close do you think they, they come to reflecting, though, uh, the, uh, what we see in other countries in the region in terms of media use and attitudes on safety and health and education? Are these countries outliers, in other words? Or are they somewhat close to the rest of the continent, do you think? Well, in terms of media use, I would say they're actually really representative because we did pick countries that are on all kinds of levels. If you look, for example, at Kenya and Nigeria, the mobile leaders, um, mobile and internet leaders in Africa, then you look at, we picked two Sahel countries in Mali, in Niger. Right. So we do have a good cross selection of countries, but yes, you're right, they're definitely not representative. And if you did an African average, we would not necessarily always come up with the values that we have mm -hmm. seen. So yes, uh, it's, I wouldn't say that it's you, looking just at the seven countries that it would be representative of the entire continent. But there are similarities with respect to safety, for example where in many countries across the continent, you do have that gender uh, imbalance. Mm -hmm. Women are far less likely to feel safe. The, the education, the very first slide that I showed about primary education is far from being universal. The numbers um, for 29 countries from 2013 were very, very similar to the seven countries that I showed. So I would say, even though I don't want to say it's representative of a continent as diverse as, as Africa um, on many issues like life evaluation, health and education, it would be very similar. Okay. Um, I'd like to focus in the first part of the Q&A on crossing over between media and public attitudes on the topics that uh, Gallup looks at in the World Poll. I assume that in our audience, we have a number of people who come from NGO communities, certainly members of the Broadcasting Board of Governors. Uh, you are involved uh, on a daily or regular basis in communicating or engaging audiences uh, in Africa or have an interest in that. So I'd like to put the Q&A in that context and talk about what we can draw from uh, the survey data. Before I do that, though, just a couple of, of uh, specific questions from the presentation. Uh, Magali, on the data that you showed uh, concerning thriving or concerning quality of life for women in the seven countries, uh, I was struck by what uh, the drivers uh, would be, and particularly in a place like Zimbabwe, where, uh, as you indicated, there are concerns on the part of women about their safety. Mm -hmm. They nonetheless show women, a fairly relatively speaking, high degree of a quality of life. Uh, so talk a little bit about what drives that quality of life uh, rating and how you look at Zimbabwe in a country like that. Okay, so in terms of the life evaluation, usually the main drivers are income. That's a, probably the biggest driver, as well as health how people rate their uh, health situation, uh, and their overall marital situation, whether they're married, you know, uh, single, uh, what's going on in their lives with their children, those are the, usually the main drivers. Um, in Zimbabwe, there's a lot of, um, from, you know, from what I know, a lot of, um, entrepreneurship among women in terms of them being very involved and being, being very active. So it's possible that that is also a big component that they take into account. They may not have a job, you know, with an employer, uh, you know, drawing a paycheck, but they're still trying to do anything they can to provide for their, for their families. So um, that must be also something that they take into account. Yeah, I'm interested in that in particular because of the fact that if we were to take your quality of life indicator, whether uh, populations are thriving or striving in their, in, in their countries, uh, as a kind of a benchmark uh, or a measure of the effectiveness even of media programs in terms of uh, encouraging what Tara Sandeshine referred to, uh, which is to help yield prosperous, peaceful societies. Mm -hmm. That might be one indicator, and then as you break that down, what would you specifically be working on? It's income, it's health, and programs that are uh, designed to uh, improve, uh, uh, to empower women, obviously, to educate women, uh, would be the types of things that you'd want to be doing on the media side in order to boost that, that score, presumably. Mm -hmm. 
Um, Sonia, in terms of uh, areas where we see <coughs> across the board uh, comparable use of media, media platforms by women and men in a country like Kenya, for example, what, what, what do you think drives that comparability in a country um, like Kenya? In Kenya, I think it's very easy to pin down again on a combination of education and language. Um, in Kenya, the, in fact, the rate of people who have post-secondary education um, between men and women is starting to get very comparable. And even the rate of women who have primary or less education in Kenya is about a third versus um, amongst males, it's, a little, it's just a little over a quarter. So it's not a huge gap here. Mm -hmm. So the education gap in Kenya is much less significant than in other countries. And also what's interesting in Kenya um, with the very large Swahili um, media offering even if you do not have the English skills, you can still use media because so much media is available in Swahili. Right. Um, so it's a little bit of chicken and egg, though, with respect to levels of education and use of media, Absolutely. right? Um, so let's then look at, in, the, in this broader context of uh, what has uh, probably drawn many of the people in the audience to come today and listen to the presentation, and that is, what are the takeaways uh, in terms of communicating with, engaging women in Africa uh, through media? Um, I'd like each of you, if you could, just a second, to sort of put on your, your strategy hat and think about uh, the information you present and what you know, uh, of course, about uh, uh, use of uh, media by women and attitudes of, of women in Africa. To think about what you can draw away from this presentation and from, your, uh, from the other data uh, with respect to strategies for communicating with women and engaging women in Africa. Magali, we'll start with you in terms of just uh, <laughs> insights you might have beyond even the data on, 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 on best practice and ideas for that. Okay, um, I mean, there are several topics that I would say are of great interest to women uh, in various African markets. Uh, we looked at safety, health, and safety, you know, the question focusing on safety walking alone in the community. This has to be looked at much more broadly with women and the violence that many women uh, experience, unfortunately, women living uh, as refugees as well as women who are living in post-conflict zones. So the, the safety issue is, is much broader than just being able to walk around you know, in your community safely at night. So issues of safety, issues of health, issues of entrepreneurship, and what a, a lot of times what uh, women want to see in programs is they want to see models and even if it's not from their own country, looking at what things have been done, what other women have done very successfully, uh, if they have been able to enter the field that are usually reserved to men, this is, it inspires them, and they like to have models, uh, and it motivates them, it encourages them, it gives them hope that they can, they can try, you know, um, so I think that uh, programs around entrepreneurship uh, would be of great interest. There's certainly, I, I did have a section uh, in my presentation about entrepreneurship and then we decided to cut it for, you know, to make sure that we stayed uh, on time here with the presentation. But there's a lot of interest in entrepreneurship uh, uh, among in those markets. Uh, for example, we had 73% of women who said that they would rather take the risk of starting their own business than work for someone else mm -hmm. uh, in those seven countries. So, and they do, you know, because it's in many ways, this is how you're gonna be put food on the table uh, in many countries in Africa because there are so few jobs available. Right. There are probably people in the audience here who have worked uh, in precisely these areas you're speaking about, women's empowerment, entrepreneurship, health issues, and so when we go to the Q&A with the audience, perhaps we'll have questions that get okay. at some of these other issues. Um, Sonia, any, any sort of broad takeaways? Well, I think um, one thing, if you want to communicate with women in Africa, the first thing you should let go of is to communicate with African women, because that is too broad a notion. I think even within a country, if you want to say, well, I want to communicate with women in Nigeria, I think that still is too broad a notion. What I would use our data for, for example, is to target down, I want to communicate with rural women in northern Nigeria. I will use a different platform. I will use a different language. I will use a completely different strategy than 
if I want to talk to young women in Lagos who I might very well reach with a, um, an English app. Mm -hmm. So that I think is a really big issue that, and we have, uh, for example, in Mali, if you want to talk to women in Mali, one thing is you don't talk to them in French, you talk to them as Voice of America does in Bambara, in Songhai. Mm -hmm. Um, on the radio. <laughs> right, a little bit of perspective for our audience. One of the reasons that the BBG were very interested, of course, in looking at women in particular, uh, they're a critical part of our audience, uh, obviously, but it's because as well, over the years, we've tended to attract more men than women uh, to, our, to our programs. In fact, the last time we, we gauged this, and this is a, sort of a rough measure, uh, we're 62% male, 38% female worldwide. So we've seen it as a, a significant area for audience growth, uh, growth in our impact. Uh, also, of course, women play a critical role in the development of their families, their communities, and their societies. And so reaching women becomes a means of uh, achieving, again, what Tara Sandenshine alluded to with respect to peaceful, prosperous, uh, and pluralistic societies, which uh, uh, we're in the business to, uh, to, to support. Um, on the use of media, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong on this, Sonia, but as I recall, use of FM uh, by both men and women uh, is usually roughly equal. Am I recalling Very that correctly? Very similar rates, yes. Um, so but, speak, speak to that in terms of, uh, of a particular platform, so, FM within radio. So that is, it's actually a very interesting notion. We ask um, in our surveys which uh, wave bands people use to listen to the radio, and we pretty much consistently find that the use of FM between men and women uh, rates are fairly similar. However, when you then go into AM and shortwave, you do find very big differences. And um, one could say there is more entertainment and music-focused um, content available on FM, especially in urban areas. You have a lot of choices. Um, versus AM kind of requires you to make a choice. You want to listen to this. Um, and it tends to be the more serious topics mm -hmm. on those. And in terms <laughs> of uh, when we do our surveys and we ask uh, those who consume our, 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 our products what they're particularly interested in, what subject areas they're interested in. What differences do you see between men, men and women? Um, one issue that we ask them on a series, we give them a series of 10 topics and ask them their interest. And one thing we always see is um, women's interest in religious topics tends to be higher, women's interest in education and health. Those are, tend to be the top three that we see. However, then when you go into um, interest in political news about their country, you start seeing very big gaps between men and women. Um, sports, not surprising. Um, women are less likely to say they're very interested in sports. And particularly older women, and in the African context, um, I would be amongst these older women, which are women 35 plus. Um, you see in the interest in science, technology, and um, IT drop very quickly, too. Mm -hmm. Um, Magali, is there anything that, <clears throat> uh, beyond entrepreneurism that you mentioned uh, that you were thinking of including in the presentation, safety, health, education, anything that, uh, something that um, strikes you in the data of the whirlpool across Africa that you'd want, want to highlight that just didn't find its way into the presentation, any outlier that you think is significant? I think that in terms of the research surrounding women, it, because there are so many topics that apply just to women, we would need to develop a module that would address those issues. But it, what is really interesting, actually, is to see how similar women and men are on so many issues, uh, looking at economic conditions. Uh, that was another slide we had, and we decided to cut it, mm -hmm. just because it was so similar. They, they, they really tend to view their environments in a very similar way, except on those key topics I brought up, health, education, safety. Safety uh, is really big. In some other countries, uh, the differences are even wider than what I showed you in Zimbabwe and in Kenya. So, um, you know, more work has to be done around this to identify the drivers. This, this, obviously, there's a sense of fear, and if, if women don't feel secure in their communities, that is going to be an impediment to doing so many things that they could be doing. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. 
Excellent. Um, I'd like to include those of you who are in attendance here today to ask any questions that are on your minds. Again, many of you uh, we know uh, come from uh, development communities, NGO communities, members of our Broadcasting Board of Governors, our Africa uh, division in particular. I'd like to recognize in our audience today uh, Gwen Dillard, who recently retired as the director of the Africa Division of the Voice of America. Uh, welcome, Gwen. I know that uh, this is a topic, obviously, women in Africa near and dear to your heart, so uh, feel free to join in asking uh, any questions, but uh, let's open the floor for questions. Yes? If you don't mind just grabbing the microphone, that would be incredibly helpful. Oh, Thanks. Thank you. I didn't see where it was coming from. OK. Um, I'm very curious about uh, trend lines. Um, I don't know how far back your data set goes or to what extent you've um, researched uh, similar studies from the past. Um, but um, I, I'm curious what kinds of major trends you see if you go back uh, several years compared to your most recent research. Uh, for example, um, are the audiences equally hopeful about the future? Um, what, was the equality in gender perception about hopefulness for the future um, always equal, or um, in, in the past were, were there differences uh, according to gender? So, uh, trends. Okay. So, in terms of the Whirlpool findings, uh, we have data going back to 2005, 2006. So, we are now fielding year nine of our Whirlpool uh, initiative. Uh, with respect to life evaluation, there's actually very little change over time. This has been, I don't want to say there is no change at all, but, uh, and I've looked at it country by country, um, there is very little change. In some countries, you may have um, a one-point change on this scale would represent a really big change. But over time, the line is uh, pretty flat for current life and uh, future life. Uh, then, you know, the other big trend is this permanent feeling of uh, insecurity for women. This has been ongoing for, for as long as we've, uh, you know, we've done the world poll. Other question? Quick question. <clears throat> Mariama Diallo from Voice of America. Um, I was just curious to know, was there anything about women who work in media uh, in those findings, like the percentage of women versus men? Not so sure. W women, women who work in media? In media, yeah, mm -hmm. in those countries. And also the other question is, um, why those seven countries? Was there a reason you picked those countries and not others? Right. Um, well, on the latter question, um, just to reiterate, those seven countries were places where we had both media data and Gallup World Poll data. So they, they were appropriate to select for that reason. Um, uh, but in terms of women in media, it, it, I don't know if there's anything that we have on that very specifically. Sorry, um, no. or, or if there's anything you meant by that question that you were looking for, that might be something that would uh, lend itself to qualitative research even in looking at how women who work in media perceive. What was the, the, the basis of your question? Let us understand a little bit more about what you intended by the question. Just wondering, because maybe the more uh, women in media uh, maybe can push other women to follow uh, mm. a little bit what's happening. Mm -hmm. So maybe that could be another research. Oh, I see. Uh -huh. it was uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Right, right. So, uh, you know. Right. Well, well, we'll get around to a question that I have. I want to keep, stay with your questions about what more we need to study. What don't we know about women uh, uh, and their use of meat in women in Africa that would help us in terms of how we communicate with and engage uh, women uh, on the continent? But other questions from the, uh, from the audience? Yes, Dan. Hi, Dan Srebny from the State Department. Thank you for this very interesting presentation. Um, talked about the importance of education, both on the lives of women in Africa and, and men, and on the media consumption habits. Could you talk, is there any findings either in these polling or in qualitative studies that Gallup or BBG have done in terms of the potential role or current role of media as education tools 
for women in Africa, both those who have some education but getting more information that they can use and knowledge, and for those who did not get formal education. Thank you. Um, from the BBG Gallup Media Service, we do, um, for example, in all our surveys, we look at um, our Learning English program. And we do see that um, learning English, the proper learning English, requires already some at least rudimentary English skills. However, in um, Mali, for example, when we looked at the rates between men and women who use the learning English programs that are already in French, then we can see that women access them at similar levels as men. So we, we used the data to look at women's learning potential through Voice of America. And I, I just want to add uh, a couple of, of things. It's mainly anecdotal, but uh, I think you'll find it interesting. Uh, I just spent a couple of weeks in Angola uh, working on a media usage survey. <laughs> and uh, I went into a lot of households to observe uh, interviews. And one of the very interesting things for me, and again, this is only anecdotal, is uh, to see the number of, uh, of people who say that they had a computer. Computer and even some, in some cases, tablet. And I ask people about that because, well, it's, Angola is more well off than a lot of countries on the continent, but it's still, you know, there are still very, very poor people there. And people told me that they felt that education was so important that if their child needed a computer to study at school, they were gonna find a way, figure out a way to raise the money to buy the computer. Even if it meant everyone in the family to chip in, but that they, their kid would have um, a, a computer. So that, that was quite interesting to hear. And then the second thing that I wanna mention is uh, basically to build on what Sonia just said about learning English. In a lot of uh, the French-speaking countries where I work, there's definitely a lot of interest, a lot of appetite to learn English. They understand that it is the language of business, the language of their own future and their success. And so they do want more ways to, to learn English um, and uh, to figure out a way to make it accessible to them considering the very low level of English that they currently speak. But there's certainly a lot of appetite in French-speaking countries and even in you know, English-speaking countries. And like Sonia pointed out, for those languages, French, English, and Portuguese, those people will learn them and will be able to manipulate them only if they are in school. So uh, working on English and English programming that is accessible to people in those countries is, I would say, something that would be uh, quite welcome. Yes? Yeah, I have a question. Um, I was just trying to intersect some of this uh, data and research that can you done. Can you tell us who you are? Uh, my name is Kenneth Adibanajra. Um, just trying to intersect some of this data and a current, the current Ebola crisis. And I'm just wondering that if you all could maybe, I suspect that not all the seven that Ebola is in some of the countries that, not the seven countries that you address, but just in general, um, how would you, in terms of con content, if you had your druthers, how would you package uh, an Ebola type education campaign uh, that would be effective using the data that you've developed? Um, well, we unfortunately, and that's something we really wish to, go, we want to go into the field and do um, current research, but yes, you're right, we do not have any current research from any of the afflicted countries. However, one thing, um, as we were strategizing a little bit, the last Liberia survey did was in 2012, and I was actually there to observe the field work, and one thing that always struck me is when we asked um, people, and also women about their English skills that within the survey they and asked about English, um, they would say, oh yes, 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 I speak English. But we, there we were a little bit careful because we then followed up with um, standard English versus pitch in English and it turned out that the vast majority would have a very big problem um, understanding standardized English broadcasts. So that's something I would think is um, particularly important communicating in Liberia. 
There were many other hands up, I think. Yes, in the back, and then we'll come up to the front. We've got several in the front that like to ask a question. Mm -hmm. um, hi, my name's Irene, and I'm from Zimbabwe. I actually wanted a clarification on how you chose your sample groups. Was it more focused on rural or urban? And if it was urban, were you looking at low income or high income um, areas? Thank you. Okay, so the surveys, and this is true not only of Zimbabwe, but of all the countries where we conduct this research, the samples are representative of the populations as a whole. So that means that we don't oversample in urban areas versus rural areas. We look at where the population lives and then we draw the sample based it's proportional to the population. So it's not surveying more women as opposed to men or vice versa, surveying people of a certain age group. It is meant to represent, to basically have a, a, a snapshot of the country. If, if in an ideal world, if we could do a census and, and administer this questionnaire to every single person in the country, basically we would get the same results. That would be too expensive to do that, so we do a random probability sample that is representative of the population as a whole. Great. I think there were several people up front here who had a question. Yeah, Betty. If, grab the mic if you don't mind. That way we can all hear you. Thank you. Hi, Betty Van Etten from Voice of America. I wanted to go down a level, if you could, on the safety issue, and I'm sort of looking at it from a programming perspective. It was health and safety. So how would you do programming to address that issue? And there's various levels sort of to shift maybe the social consciousness, if you will, in the treatment of women. And there are examples currently in the US, you know, the NFL and the search for one woman in Charlottesville. What would resonate or, or help the women address, and not just the women, it's probably the society in general, right. to, to deal with that issue. Is it just from a criminal walking, don't walk alone at night, or is it more the social consciousness, if you will, of the treatment of women in general? And I'm, if you could give any more information you have. Okay, I think it also depends on where those women live, because you're gonna have very you could have different perceptions whether women are in rural areas and what rural areas as opposed to uh, cities. So in many communities, they are very small and everybody in the community knows everyone. So if there is a stranger, that person is flagged right away. Uh, but I think that there, you know, you could approach this in very different ways. There are so many um, topics that could be covered. Um, Maybe there are some issues of domestic violence. This is a really big topic in many countries in Southern Africa, for example. Uh, there is also the issue of women living in post-conflict zones, as I mentioned er earlier, and the type of situations that they experience. Then um, uh, women living in cities, maybe it's in certain neighborhoods uh, and are there, in some areas, have the, the communities done something like neighborhood watches, you know, to, because they've recognized that it is a problem and that they want to address it and to show this in, in a program to see what has been done. Uh, and I think that it always inspires people to learn from other experiences to have the models that I mentioned earlier and see what, how can that apply to my situation here and whether I too can um, you know, get a group of neighbors together to start a neighborhood watch. Uh, so that's some of the, the topics that I could think of right now. I think there's a, uh, an added component here too that uh, we obviously spend a lot of time thinking about which is uh, violence by extremist groups uh, that are obviously of a particular concern to different parts of Africa, including the areas that we were covering in these samples, northern Mali, obviously, in Nigeria, Boko Haram, uh, moving into East Africa, Somalia, obviously, Al-Shabaab, and creeping in, of course, and, and significantly into Kenya. 
So uh, on that, let me just um, add a question uh, to Betty's, uh, Magali, uh, with respect to attitudes towards other kinds of violence, not the normal criminality that will occur uh, in, in, in neighborhoods, but uh, the, the violence that comes from extremist organizations. Anything about that in recent surveys it, with respect, to, uh, not that people are uh, you know, obviously gonna be against that kind of violence generally, but anything of any, any insights that you could draw from the, from the research in that regard? Um, I think that in that cluster of countries in the Sahel, there would be a lot of interest you know, with the way people are trying to deal with what has happened to the girls in, in northern Nigeria. Uh, so in Niger, Mali, there would be a lot of interest in stories like that. And then moving on to the Horn of Africa, what Al-Shabaab is doing. Overall, um, and this is something we saw in the Mali survey uh, last year, you know, in the grand scheme of things, these are not the, the topics that they focus on because they have issues of poverty and so they, it doesn't bubble to the top, but that doesn't mean that it's not an important topic. Uh, and it's something that I would say is of, would be of great interest to people in those localized regions of the Sahel and the Horn of Africa. That, that is a very important point um, in terms of, and, and, the, and the significance of, importance of research in discerning what actually matters to people in their daily lives, mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to what uh, we might perceive sure. as mm -hmm. mattering to them in their daily lives as we, as we look at uh, Africa from you know, many thousand miles away. Um, so for our purposes, the research is really critically important so as not to miss the mark entirely in trying to reach right. uh, different populations by overweighting a topic, yes. Uh, my name is Siri Nairab. I'm with the Africa Division at Voice of America. Excellent. I'm not sure your, the Hello, mic Sonia. is. Can, can everyone, everyone hear? Yeah. Keep, keep, keep okay. going. Just make sure we can hear you. Okay. There we Magali, are. you and I Skyped on uh, recent um, focus groups regarding uh, programming. Yes. To, so nice to meet you in person. Nice to meet you. I wanted to follow up on, and, and the results are not in, as they say, formally on these focus groups. But what struck me, and this is regarding um, a program, television program, targeted to young people in Francophone Africa, is that, um, that there seemed to be an interest in the commonality between youth there and youth here, um, an interest in um, what the common problems are and how they're resolved, but also a projection of positive um, role models for Africa mm -hmm. and not just saying, oh, the problems are this, that, and then the other thing and dwelling on um, um, what is lacking, let's say. Do you, do you care to follow up on that? I mean, I know that this is, I'm not asking you to give formal results now, but is that a fair, fair um, assessment? Yes, what was really striking, and this is a, um, a pilot program that we, television program we tested in Abidjan, in Kinshasa. <clears throat> and uh, what came out of many of the, the, the conversations was this interest in having role models, very strong role, role models, where people feel they would be inspired to see other young Africans, especially the program we had with the young uh, leaders, African leaders who were invited uh, to the United States. And it was fascinating because it was really, it showed uh, the participants in the focus groups that it was inspiring them. They, they wanted to know how you get invited to be in, in America and how you can study. But also the important piece was the fact that those people are gonna go back and that what they learned here, they're gonna be able to use this for the benefit of their country to basically have Ivory Coast or one person was from Congo actually uh, to make a better DRC. Uh, so they, there's a lot of interest in the very positive stories of you know, people being able to succeed, but also giving back to their country. There was also a lot of interest in 
knowing about what young Americans are doing, because the, the, the name of the, of the show is Vous and Nous, so it's basically you and us, and how we can have this bridge between the African continent and the United States. And for participants to be really interested in what young people are experiencing in, in America. So not just that they are always succeeding, but also the challenges that they face as young people. So a lot of times we would hear about, they want to know about unemployment, that it exists in the United States. We would hear about gangs and drugs, all these issues that you know we don't think would be of any interest to an audience uh, on another continent, but they seem to have an appetite for that as well. And I think it's to, it's really to show um, a more realistic picture of you know what life is about uh, in the United States. That was their interest. Great. Other questions? Let me follow up with one that um, uh, is of great concern, of course, to those of us at uh, uh, Broadcasting Board of Governors, in particular the Voice of America and reaching audiences in, in Africa, and that's the use of vernacular languages over regional languages, or in addition to uh, regional languages, and particularly in light of reaching women and the languages they speak, prefer to speak, uh, due to varying educational levels. Um, so both Magali and, and, and Sonia, if you, if you could speak to the importance of vernaculars in, in whichever society you'd like to focus on in the 70s are going to vary, of course, in terms of vernacular languages. Um. You have my pet peeve, yes. Um, <laughs> vernacular languages really are key to getting to the audience, especially if you want to look, if you want to communicate to those segments of the audience who are less educated, which in many of the countries we looked at today are women. Um, so just to hop on again about Mali, 15% of women speak French. Mm -hmm. um, so if you want to talk to the other 85%, you need to use vernaculars like we did in, with Bambara and Songhai. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anything to add to that, Megan? I, I would agree with what Sonia just said. Uh, if, if you want to reach people, especially in more remote areas, people who have a very low level of education, you're going to have to talk to them in you know, the language that they can understand. Uh, the challenge is that a lot of those languages have uh, variants. They have many dialects. And so which one to focus on that is that can be very challenging. But Vernacular languages are key, yeah. We, we just had, uh, in fact, Jeremy Gross, who heads the French to Africa Service, is with us today, and I'll acknowledge Jeremy. He was leading a team just uh, the last several weeks to uh, West Africa and Senegal and, and Mali and, and uh, Cote d'Ivoire, uh, particularly looking at the development of local FM radio stations. And in the context of what we're talking about here, reaching women, uh, as we noted earlier, if you're using FM, uh, you have a greater chance of, it, of incorporating women into your audience, and also then if you uh, touch on the issues that matter to them, but then the question of language. You have to be clearly, it's an obvious statement, but it's very mm -hmm. true, and, and, and sometimes the facts on the ground somewhat contradict some of our preconceived ideas about which languages people speak. You have to be in the language they speak, obviously, or not, you're not going to connect with them in, in any way. Something else I wanted to touch on before we close, which is going back to uh, the development now, still nascent in places like Niger, obviously uh, very well established uh, and growing in Kenya, and that is uh, social media, uh, digital media of all kinds and social media in particular. Uh, but if, uh, Sonia, you could comment on, uh, in terms of uh, communication engagement strategy, choosing platforms by country and, and how to go about that given where so use of social and digital media uh, lies right now. Um, well, as you've said, it is really the range of social media use varies very widely in the Sahel. It's nascent. Um, Kenya, Niger Nigeria in particular, we see its um, social media has been wild widely embraced. Um, women use it too. Um, we had, in fact, we've done uh, a special study on the so use of social media um, last year in Nigeria, and we were surprised for to see when we ask people, so how do you use it to talk about news and information? Their definition of news and information is, and we've seen this in other countries before, so it wasn't a huge surprise, but what we think of news and information when we often think about political news, um, serious topics, um, 
it's very differently um, defined on the ground. Um, news and information is um, often, hey, there's a new movie. Um, do you want to come see that movie? And so we need to be cognizant of the fact that the use of social media is very much embedded in people's daily lives into what they really care about. And that's not always what we think they care about. Mm -hmm. Is there another burning question from the audience? I have time for one more. Uh -huh, please, we need to just uh, we'll provide a microphone if we can so we can be sure to hear you. And then we'll close uh, right on time. Thank you. Um, my name is Lola Akomatri. I'm from Togo, and um, um, I came from a French-speaking country. And uh, I'm here um, as part of the YALI program, the Mandela Washington Fellowship Program. Excellent. Thank you. So right now I'm interning at the VOA, the Voice of America. So what I want to add is that, um, as you just mentioned about um, the social media, I think uh, the young generation is very dynamic in terms of social media. And uh, back home, um, I'm a journalist, and I'm also part of the, the National Union of Journalists. So um, what we do and what we have noticed, basically, is that the, the young generation, they used to be very interested in some uh, the political issues, the economic issues. Every, it's not just going to Facebook, for example, to chat or to see, to watch a movie or to YouTube, but when you see most of um, the YouTube channels that are very popular in my country is when um, you can see um, the young people just um, using their mobile phone to just um, do some video shooting on protesting or pr some protest strike and everywhere just to sensitize you know, the large audience and his work. Even in my country, we are working on a project how to, um, to cover the, the presidential election with uh, the social media. So it means that uh, people are very aware of you know, the critical issues in, in the country. Uh, talking about the women issues, um, what I want to add is that, um, you know, uh, there is a lot of um, you know, uh, best practice in the continent. It's not just um, uh, about war. It's not just about uh, domestic violations. You know, uh, there is a lot of uh, best practice. Like in my country, for example, uh, in terms of um, domestic violence against women. You can see we, I work with an organization and what they have is a sort of shelter, like, and they have also a hotline that if you just notice or witness um, a violence against a woman, you just have to call that number and then they will come to the house and talk to the, to the husband, take the woman uh, to a shelter if they, there is any, any kind of danger she's facing. You know, so I think even uh, in the rural area, talking about um, uh, in terms of education. Women uh, are trying, uh, when you go to school, you have the opportunity to learn more than one language. You know, we are learning French, we are learning English, and we are even learning <coughs> dialects. So it means that in my country, for example, when you go even in the market to talk to people, when you speak English, they can understand you. When you speak French, they can really understand you. It means that you can partner with them, you can do a business with them. They can even try, I mean, travel to English-speaking country to do the business because they are literate. They are going to school to learn it. Even in the rural area, people are struggling to, you know, uh, to get education. So I think um, we should more focus on the positive aspects on the continent instead of what's not going on well, because uh, people are very conscious about the problem that we have, but they are also trying to address that kind of problem. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much for raising the aspect of the content creation. And in fact, I think that's almost an inspiration for a whole other event. Because as you said, um, people are starting to film, film events um, and the whole notion of 
media or communication no longer being this one-way thing, like you know, you listen to somebody talking to you on the radio. Nowadays, with mobile and internet and social networking, you can talk back and you can offer your own opinions. You can share your own content and your own experiences with broadcasting organizations. I think that's really a very exciting tool for the future. Great. And thank you. Thank you very much. Chris, over to you. Let's give a nice round of applause for our, for our panelists. <laughs> Just a couple of reminders and then we'll, we'll close. One, um, the video from today will be posted on the BBG website in the next day or two. Also the, the PowerPoint presentation. And finally, just a reminder that uh, October 16th, we're going to be doing an event on, on Pakistan. So thank you all for joining us today. We're adjourned.